Hey, Sanctus Church, welcome back. We're so glad that you're joining us here today, either live or on demand or podcast la later. Welcome back to this series called Glimpses of God out of the book of Esther. Now, we all love great turning points. Winter turns to spring, night is broken by day, the good guys win, justice over injustice, hard work pays off. We love watching it, but we also love experiencing it. Well, in chapter 6, and by the way, if you've got a Bible, physically or virtually, turn back to Esther 6, because in this moment, it's like fresh air, it like sweeps through this really dangerous, dark story. And let me say this again. God's silence does not equal His absence. Now, we ended in the story of Esther two weeks ago with Haman having his best friends and his family and his wife, and there's a mention of all his sons, celebrating as they literally have death being set up in their family compound. Let me read this really dark, scary part of the story again out of Esther 5.4. His wife and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up, reaching to a height of 75 feet, and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Just sit with that for a sec. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. Well, the suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. See, everything seems right in Haman's world. Everything is going in his direction. But God. <laughs> Esther 6.1. That night, the king could not sleep. So he ordered the book of Chronicles, the record of his reign, to be brought to him and to be read to him. So the king can't sleep. And we would think reading a book would not be the way he puts himself back to sleep. He probably would call one of his many women from his harem to help him go back to sleep. Or maybe he drinks some more wine. He sure seems to like that. But no, no. He has the record of his reign read to him so he can go back to sleep. He's just like us. Have you ever picked up the largest or hardest or most boring be book to put you back to sleep? Or maybe you put on an audio book to help you lull you back to sleep? Or maybe he's like some of us, not me, maybe like you, where actually you only need four or five hours of sleep a night, and so you work much of the night. Well, there's more going on here than meets the eye. See, the Greek version of the Old Testament translates the verse as this, the mighty one took away the king's sleep. See, this is not just stress or insomnia or boredom or he's an amazing work ethic. See, there's so much more. God sets this up. God takes away the king's sleep. The insomnia will lead to God's next move, his will, his plan moving forward. God's silence is not his absence. So the official record is being read to him. Now, these records were the official notes of the court, and much of the time they were a record not only of administrative decisions, but of the great feats of people in his kingdom and how the king would reward them. See, never forget during this time, the kings are always obsessed about keeping power and assassination is always happening. So how do you stop assassinations and how do you keep your friends and enemies really close? Oh, you keep rewarding them. History is full of this. Here's two historical examples by Herodias who lived and recorded this king's time. In one case, two, king, two ship captains battled the Greeks and they were given land for their work and they were called the king's benefactors. Another time, there was an assassination attempt against this king's brother and a person saved the king's brother and this man became a governor of a whole provident, a province. So as the king is being read, all the records from now five years ago, something happens. It was found recorded that there that Mordecai had exposed two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, who'd conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. What honor and recognition did Mordecai receive for this act? The king asked. Well, nothing has been done for him. The attendants answered. Again, can you feel the presence of God in this? So many, quote unquote, chances. Why this night? Why the insomnia? Why had Mordecai not received unbelievable reward five years earlier? Why, why no sleep? Why this record in this part of the record at this moment in time? And now the greatest coincidence is about to happen. God's going to fulfill his word. See, remember what Solomon, the great wise king, wrote in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haunty spirit before a fall. 
Well, God is about to reverse the tables. After hearing such an amazing report, the king wants to act now. Classical A-type leader. And the same is true of Haman. He's a leader. He has a job that he thinks needs to be done right now. One wants to honor Mordecai. The other wants to kill Mordecai. And they both want to do it right now. Two leaders, two pressing matters, both motivated to do their own will. But see, what they both don't understand is this motivation, this intensity, is actually going to accomplish a third person's will, God's. The king said, well, to his attendants, who's in the court? Well, Haman had just entered into the outer court of the palace to speak to the king about impaling Mordecai in a pole he'd set up for him. His attendants answered, well, Haman's now standing in the court. Ah, bring him in, the king ordered. So Haman comes in either really late or really early in the morning, after hours to talk to his boss and his friend about killing Mordecai just a little earlier than, you know, the rest of the Jews. And then the king is awake, listening to his audiobook, and suddenly the king wants to see Haman. Can you hear them both saying, excellent, everything's lining up as I planned. Verse 6, well, Haman entered and the king asked him, what should be done for the man? whom the king delights to honor. Now Haman thought to himself, who is there that the king would rather honor other than me? <laughs> so he answered the king, well, for the man the king delight to honor, have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king also has ridden on, one with the royal crest placed on its head, and let the robe and horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. And then, then let that person robe the man, the king delights to honor, and lead him on that horse throughout the, sea, uh, the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Now, I've heard this story almost my whole life, but I've missed so much. See, Haman is already second in command of the largest empire on earth. He's already wealthy beyond imagination. <coughs> he's full of pride. He's murderous. He's greedy. And the only thing he does not have is being king. So if you can't be king, at least get the king's honor. See, many historians point out that in this culture, it was the supernatural belief in the Persian worldview that the king's bed, the king's throne, and the king's robes were endowed with magical power. So this would give Haman more supernatural power and wearing his robe and riding his royal horse would publicly declare, declare and reinforce his already awesome relationship with the king. But again, what we really see here is the desire of Haman to be king. But since he's either not able to do it or not willing to assassinate the king, he gets as close as he can. One of the commentators I read within the last few weeks said, and it's in an American context, but we all get it. It would be like if you had access to Air Force One anytime. Oh, yeah, I'm going down to Disney. But just, you know, I'm flying Air Force One. You're flying Air Force One? Oh, yeah, yeah. Me and the president, just like this. I can get on Air Force Aruba. Want to go to Aruba? No problem. We're going on Air Force One. Everybody be like, oh, my goodness. That's what this is. Well, the king's really excited about this suggestion. So he says in verse 10, you go at once. He commanded Haman, you get that robe and that horse and do just as you have suggested for Mordecai, the Jew. Oh, who sits at the king's gate. Do not neglect anything you have recommended. Can you imagine the shock, the anger, the hate? This was supposed to be the very day that I was going to finally kill off that Jew Mordecai. And now I have to honor him. This is the beginning of the end of Haman. But more, can you imagine the moment when Haman showed up to talk to Mordecai? I guarantee you Mordecai was like, this is it. I'm going to get killed or murdered or something. And in that moment of death and humiliation, suddenly life is offered by the hand of his enemy. Well, verse 11, so Haman got the robe and the horse. And he robed Mordecai, and he led him on horseback through the city streets, proclaiming before him, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor. Can you imagine Haman saying again and again and again in public, the king honors this man, and I honor this man, and this man is amazing, and the king loves this man. There's an old English expression saying, it's like gravel in your mouth or my mouth. Imagine you're talking, and as you're talking, you have dirt and small rocks in your mouth as you're trying to talk. Dangerous, gross, uncomfortable. You'd be choking, spitting up. This is what it felt like emotionally for Haman. 
Now, beyond the biblical account of this honoring between Haman and Mordecai publicly, in the Jewish community, there's an old um, wives' tale almost. It's folklore that was taught by rabbis to Jewish children. And it involved Haman's daughter. Now, it reads like this. As Haman was walking through the streets proclaiming how amazing his enemy Mordecai was, Haman's daughter threw a pot of excrement, crap, from the roof onto the head of the man she thought was Mordecai, but really in the end was her father, which of course deepened Haman's shame. And the story ends with him coming home and telling his daughter that she had thrown the crap on his head. And as she heard the story, she was so taken back, she slipped, fell off the roof, and she died. (laughs) Well, I'm not sure if that happened, but it shows you the wildness of this moment. Now, don't forget, see, we make the mistake of reading the Bible like a comic book, and we miss all the middle parts. Things are incredibly dangerous still. Don't forget the king's law still stands. All the Jews are going to be killed, annihilated, genocide, including Mordecai. But this is God's move to honor and raise up his people, even in this non-winnable situation. Now, what happens next is so insightful (coughs) and so helpful and so forming for us if we want it to be, is this boring little verse, verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai returned to the king's gate. Mordecai went back to work, back to everyday life. He didn't Instagram the parade. He didn't publicly launch a relations tour. He just went back to work. Nothing really public from him. Oh, it says, but Haman, verse 12, rushed home. His head is covered in grief. He told his wife and all his friends everything that had happened. And his advisors and his oh so lovely wife said to him, well, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, wow, huggy, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him, you're surely going to come to ruin. No love, no support, no we're angry about this, no actually we actually are partly responsible for setting up this whole mess. No, no, just you're going to get it. Well, there's a lesson here, by the way. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And if the people that you hang out with, literally online or in person, always want to cancel people, kill people, mock people, or gossip about people when they're not in the room or in the room, let me reassure you of something. When it comes your turn, they'll treat you no different. And notice, Haman's so-called loyal wife and all his friends talk about his coming doom. Well, too bad for you. But why? Oh, because they say Mordecai is a Jew. See, his God is with him, and obviously that God is with them. See, this is the pattern again and again seen throughout the Old Testament in the mouth of the enemies of God. All the way back in the time of Joshua, when they were spying out the land and they encountered Rahab. Do you remember what Rahab said in Joshua 2.8? I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on all of us. So all of us that live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Shion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, who you completely destroyed. Oh, when we heard it, our hearts melted in fear. Everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and earth below. In the time of Samuel, when the Israelites were fighting the Philistines, It says in 1 Samuel 4, 6, when they learned that the ark of God had come into the Jewish camp, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into that camp. They said, oh no, nothing like this has ever happened before. We're doomed. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods, these gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness? In other words, what we hear in the mouth of Haman's wife is, well, we know what God has done through and for the Jewish people in the past. And it would seem, though we didn't really expect it, He's going to do it again. Nothing and no one can stand against God. And by the way, suddenly we see that Haman is no longer in control. 
And we see this in the most sort of simple way in verse 14. When they were still talking with Haman, the king's eunuchs arrived and hurried Haman away to the banquet Esther had prepared. He couldn't say no. He had to go. Did you catch it? I didn't the first uh, few readings. Esther is not really mentioned in this chapter at all, other than she's got a banquet. The hero of the story is not here. <laughs> the grand turning point in the story, she's not present, which again is the point. Who's the hero? Whose glory is this all about? Who is all of this about? Malachi? Some say, oh, actually, he's the real hero in the story. Well, no. God, silent but not absent, is the hero. See, the sovereignty of God is the point. God is the hero. God took the king's sleep, and God set up all these so-called random chances, and God lifts up, and God brings down. The gods that Haman had called upon through divination, the gods that his Amalekite ancestor had called, called upon, they're not in charge. They're not stronger than the Lord Almighty. The king of the greatest empire on earth, he can't even sleep because God says no. Haman is second in command, not in charge. Haman's wife, not in charge. His sons, not in charge. His friends, not in charge. God is. So, Sanctus Church, let me ask you this question. Why has God given us this part of His Word at this moment, in this season, to us? Well, again, when things seem out of control or when things keep changing by the hour, and we'd all use the word of unstable, when dreams die or come back to life, when plans fail, we have to hold on to the rock that does not move. What is God trying to say to you, literally to you, to me, to us? Lesson one. The way that every generation of Christians has moved from surviving to thriving is their real, genuine belief in God's sovereignty and His providence. Sovereignty means God's in charge. Providence is when sovereignty is acted upon. Uh, providence is when God interferes in human affairs to bring His will on earth. Providence can be done in really profound ways. Miracles, splitting the Red Sea, raising Jesus back from the dead. It also can be worked out in really boring everyday life. But in the end, the point is that God, as He keeps interfering through providence, through His sovereignty, He's going to work everything out for His glory and our benefit and our freedom. I love when one author reflecting on the story of Esther talks about providence this way. Providence matters when things are really tough. Trusting in God's providence doesn't take away the pain or trauma of Esther. She would have experienced, for example, of being separated from her uncle or her friends, being denied. Have you thought about this? Her dreams of maybe being a future Jewish woman or wife or mother. Esther did not have the big picture that we as readers of the Bible have in terms of the role she played in God's final deliverance, and neither do we see the whole picture when it comes to the unfathomable, tragic, and traumatic events in our own lives, and also in the lives of the ones we love. We don't got all the information. We don't have all the data. We can't see everything. We don't know what God is doing sometimes. Sometimes we're able to look back on our lives and make sense of what seemed at the time to be senseless or unnecessary or even cruel. At other times, the mystery of God, God's working, remains mystery. And unlike Job, we're not even privy to God's perspective. But here's the point. You have to make a decision. Do you actually believe that God is really in charge and God in large and small ways is really interfering and at the end of the day, God is still good. Just sit with that, because that allows you to go to the next step. Because the next lesson that God is giving us is, this moment is a time to look back before we actually move forward. If you've noticed, it's sort of really quiet. Throughout the story of Esther, God's people look back every time before they move forward. 
Back in chapter 4, Mordecai said, God will raise up a deliverer for us, whether it's through you, Esther, or someone else. We know. How did he know this? Because he knew his Jewish history. Here, <laughs> the Jewish enemies know even what the Jewish God has done in history. So, ready? Here's the note. So, after you've said, once again, or for the first time, and truly believe that God is sovereign, and His providence is real, and God is good, then you can start moving forward after you look backward. See, as we start transitioning out of this COVID moment, you need to stop and take time this week to look back and list all the things you know God has done, has promised over the last 12 months. So you will be able to move forward. See, the pattern is repeated all through the Bible, but especially in the Psalms, especially remembrance Psalms. Psalm 136.1, Give thanks to the Lord, His good, His love endures forever. To Him who struck down the great kings, His love endures forever. And, and killed the mighty kings, His love endures forever. And Shion, king of the Amorites, His love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, His love endures forever. He gave land, He gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to His servant Israel, His love endures forever. God, through this time, has been and still is inviting you and us as a church to be marked historically by rooting our thanksgiving in history, in the middle, so then we can walk out of the middle. So you can only be thankful after an event has taken place, not before. So let me say this again. Have you stopped and looked back to see God's hand intentionally? Think about all the times you've seen God step in just before you stepped out. You should do this for your own story. You should do this for your family. You should do this actually for our church's story. This, this week, if you really want to take something home out of the sermon, sit down and record all the events in the last 12 months or beyond that you know God showed up and acted. And notice that thankfulness is not in a bunch of theological ideas. It's rooted in real experience and historical events. So let me ask you, have you done this during this COVID moment? Have you intentionally looked backward to see all the amazing moments of God as He's about to let us move forward. But there's one last lesson, call, invitation, maybe command that God wants to give some of us. And it's this. Let God do the lifting up if He wants to do it. We live in a time of personal brands and personal platforms and self-promotion. And what we are being presented here is such a life-giving lesson. What a Jesus-forming story that the Holy Spirit is giving many of us today through the life of Mordecai. There was a little book back in the 1880s written by a guy named Alexander Raleigh. And he was reflecting on Mordecai's rise to power, specifically being paraded around by Haman. And this is what he wrote out of that little verse he went back to the king's gate. He said, a proud and ambitious man would have said to himself, no more of this king's gate for me. I shall direct my steps down to the king's palace and hold myself ready for honor, which surely must now be at hand. But it seems Mordecai said within himself, if these things are designed for me in God's good providence, then they're going to find me. But they must seek me. I will not seek them. Those who confer them know my address. Mordecai, I just live at the king's gate. There they're going to find me. Let the crowds wandering and wandering disperse. I've had enough of their praise or incense. And Haman go wherever he will. He's in the hands of God too. And let my friends at home wait. Uh, they will hear on all good time. But I can wait in the best old place and the accustomed place called the king's gate. I mean, this is what Peter later taught all Christians in 1 Peter 5, 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. This is a quote right out of Proverbs 3 from Solomon. James, Jesus' half-brother, also quotes it in his little letter. In other words, he says, If you are a genuine follower of God, humble yourself under the hand of God. Do the opposite of pride and self-sufficiency. Humble yourself to those who are in authority over you. Humble yourself in this time. Humble yourself in this season of life, and God will lift you up in due time. 
Once again, we are invited back into that spiritual practice, that holy habit we talked about within this last ministry year, which is at the heart of the other disciplines of prayer and fasting. It's the biblical uh, invitation of biblical secrecy. Remember one person defined it this way, it's a conscious refraining from having our good deeds and qualities generally known, which in turn rightly discipline our longing for recognition. And as I read all these people, remember they said two things, you either start doing this practice by taking steps to prevent our acts from being known, without lying of course, and by doing it, we experience a stronger relationship with God independent of the opinions of others. In our competitive, social media-driven world, this is massive. Now, why would we choose this? Because we want eternal reward. We want God to be our audience because remember, God is the better king. Dallas Willard wrote these words, the desperate attempt for people to advertise themselves is truly unbelief. It reveals that they need the attention of others and not God's. Now, Jesus rightly said, a city in a hill cannot be hidden. And so we will not hide, be hidden as we do all our acts unto God or even do our business, I could add. But secrecy, I love this, I quoted it before. Secrecy, rightly practice, enables us to place our public relations department entirely in the hands of God. Is the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Is he pointing you to Mordecai, asking you to become more like Mordecai in the moment, sitting at the king's gate, not doing what you can do? Does he want to build rest for you? Does he want you to take all the energy you've been using to promote you and actually just stop and maybe redirect that energy to rest or other things? By the way, let me just give some hope as we end this moment. Whether in this life or in the next, through the physical resurrection of every Christian, every single one of us will be vindicated. Don't forget this. God is the better king, and God's will can never fully be thwarted in the end. And the truth is, by the way, if you are a Christian, you will be raised up like Mordecai in the end. I mean, this is why Paul wrote in Romans 8, 38, I am convinced, I know that I know that I know that neither death or life or angels or demons, neither the present or the future or any power, neither height or depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. We at the resurrection, when he brings us all back from the dead and restores the heavens and the earth, we will all be lifted up and the enemies will be removed. Here's the question out of this little passage in Esther 6. How do I respond this week to become more like Jesus? Number one, I don't know if you remember a few weeks ago, I asked you to say something out loud because sometimes when we think we don't say it out loud, it doesn't count. And I remember I asked the whole church to say, I am here in Canada in this moment. God has let me be born either in this country or I'm an immigrant, but I've moved here and God wants me here to be his witness in this time. He's got this, okay. Here's what I'd love you all to do this week, whether you're driving in a car or just having a moment alone, I want you to say out loud, I believe God is really sovereign. Then I want you to say out loud, I really believe in the providence of God. You need to say, and God is good. God needs to undo some unbelief in our church in Jesus' name when it relates to the sovereignty of God, the province of God, and the goodness of God. Because if you don't believe those three things, you can't keep moving forward. And we as a church absolutely cannot keep reaching forward to reach 10,000 and do our God-given mission and vision. Here's the second thing. If you want to get perspective, also sit down this week and look backwards and write out all the things that you've seen God do. It's what builds your faith. It's how you get out of the middle. You look back historically to build thanksgiving. You become thankful and then you move forward. So you need to say, I believe in the sovereignty of God and I also ready, I believe in the providence of God and I believe that God is good and, and I'm gonna take time to go back and see all the small and large things that God has done in my life or in the last 12 months so I will be reminded. It's like as a staff this week, we, we've been compiling all the stuff, even beyond the vision talk Samuel and I gave, but all the stuff that has been good that has been done across our church 
as we're getting ready to release the annual report. And as I was reading it, I was like, oh my goodness, so God has done so much, so much good has been done. But until you stop and intentionally compile and remember, you will not be thankful. I encourage you to journal this week, even if you don't like journaling, write down all the things that God did in the last 12 months so you will know he is still good. And lastly, ask God this question, is God inviting me to let him lift me up when he desires? In my job, in my life, in my faith, like in general. That could be a real moment of surrender and a real moment of freedom. So why don't we just end with a simple prayer. God of Esther and God of Mordecai, found fully in the face and the life and the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, uh, revealed by the Holy Spirit. Here's our prayer. God, would you send out the Holy Spirit, Father and Son, send the Spirit to encourage us to trust in the sovereignty of you and the good providence of you and to declare that you're good. And, and then, Holy Spirit, would you begin to start bringing to mind all the things, small and large, you have done it shouldn't be out of the mouth of enemies <laughs> that the good things of God are remembered, but it should be out of the mouth of the people who know you. Inspire thanksgiving and faith and hope. And lastly, I ask for that small particular group, Lord, because you know it's about motive and situation, would you speak so strongly, so sharply, so directly, so, so comfort, in a comforting way and say, you need to be Mordecai. And just Holy Spirit, tell people that are actually going beyond the sphere of what they're supposed to be doing to rest and trust, to learn humility is okay, and to be raised up in your time. Work this stuff out continually in us, we ask. In the name of Jesus, we all pray together. Amen.